Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ken Baker, Better Bricks Education and Training. Thank you all for coming today. Thank you to those folks on site. We have a good group here. Thank you to all you folks out there online. Um, for the online folks, once in a while we have had it occur that uh, it'll, it'll go down, the, the uh, broadband will go down. That happens, wait a few minutes and log back in, it'll, it'll, it'll be worth doing. But it has happened before, so apologize for that. It's not going to happen tonight. So um, I want to thank the Integrated Design Lab both here and at Bozeman, so the U of I Integrated Design Lab and the Bozeman, and Idaho Power Company and Northwestern Energy. Thanks to them for sponsoring th these events, and we have these sessions uh, uh, every spring and every fall here at the Integrated Design Lab. I um, also want to tell you we have more sessions this year. This is, a, uh, this is only the uh, second of uh, six sessions, and uh, next week on Thursday we're going to have everything you ever wanted to know, to know about, a dimming about dimming ballast, but we're afraid to try, and it's research from uh, NRC. It should be really, really good, as tonight's will be. That'll be Guy Newsham next week. want to also tell you, uh, remind everyone that <coughs> those that are local here tomorrow all day uh, we have the ASHRAE conference in town. Arden where's the, where's the location? Oxford Suites. Oxford Suites. Out by the Edwards Theater here off Cole Road. Okay out by the Edwards Theater so right off of the interstate there on Cole Road. So if you're interested in learning more uh, uh, technical information tomorrow that ASHRAE conference is a, is a good thing to consider. Um, for those of that you that are here, please sign in. If you're online, you had to sign in to get here. Um, for those who are on site, we can offer uh, AIA credits. So it's real important for architects to sign in on the AIA sheet. Appreciate that, that you do that. And they are sustainable design credits. So that's a good thing. Yeah, we have a uh, BSUG, a building simulation users group now, a kickoff meeting April 14th, which that should be pretty cool. You've been working on that for some time. So April 14th, and it's going to be right here at the IDL Boise from 12 to 1. Sound good? Okay. Tonight's topic is something that we've, um, I think we've worked on and looked at for a few years now, and it's energy modeling versus the real, real, real performance of buildings, so energy modeling versus reality. We have a good speaker here. We have Micah Allen from eSource. He's the manager of uh, the technical assistance service at eSource, and what he's going to do for the next hour or so is give us a really good presentation on that, so I'll let you take it away. Thanks right. for being here, Micah. Thank you very much. So uh, I'd like to thank everybody for taking the time to come here and be online too. Um, so I'm, I, uh, I'm really excited about this presentation because it combines some things I'm really interested in. Uh, to give a little background, I work with eSource, which does uh, energy information, or business and energy intelligence for utilities all across North America. And so a lot of times we, uh, we talk to them about how different energy efficiency technologies and programs and things work. But before this, I've been sort of in the energy world for a while doing everything from uh, energy modeling to uh, project management of retrofits to actually getting my hands on stuff and making and, uh, and upgrading buildings. Uh, the topic I'd like, like to talk about today is uh, modeled versus reality when it comes to energy simulation. And really, if you guys want a sneak preview of my thesis of the whole thing, it's that there should be an ongoing conversation. Modeling is a phenomenal tool, as are, and green buildings do perform really exceptionally well. But what I want to highlight is some, er, some problems and challenges that came up with some different exemplary energy buildings and sort of what, what made those problems transpire, maybe some general solutions around it. But really, the, the biggest overall solution is to keep an open dialogue between the every different faction that's working into designing a new building. And so on that note, I'd really like it if we could uh, have an open dialogue in this, in this presentation too, because I, I, you know, I've got some experience, but I don't have all, um, as much experience as everybody else in this room. So along the way, if you think of uh, questions or comments or experiences uh, on projects that you might have worked on or, or heard about that you'd like to bring up, I'd really love to hear them because I really want to to stay engaged and see where you guys are coming from as well. But uh, with that, I'd like to, to leap into this, the conversation about modeled versus reality in, in uh, mostly in commercial buildings. 
For me, the, the, the real distinction started, or the, the first time I really noticed that there was this the difference was actually as a kid. I lived in a house that had a sunroom. It was uh, designed in the 70s, really well, well made. It had like a, uh, lots of uh, windows that shine on a, on a stone floor that was designed to hold lots and lots of heat so it could re-radiate heat into the house throughout the day. And the thing I remember noticing as a kid is that room in the winter was freezing all the time and it was a net drain on the whole house. And really what had happened is when you look out the window, you got this great view of all these evergreens that pretty much effectively blocked off the south side of the uh, building. So the idea was right. I'm sure somebody somewhere along the line put pen to paper and, and figured out how much energy they were expecting to save. They just weren't counting on, in the intervening years, a whole forest of evergreens coming up. So. Um, so for me, that's kind of, kind of where, we're, where uh, an interest and passion for building energy started. And I got to study it in different places and actually work doing energy simulation for a while as well. So with that, uh, I'd like to jump ahead and talk about this building. It looks like a nice building. It's the Chesapeake Bay Foundation's Philip Merrill Building. Uh, it's an environmental center in Annapolis, Maryland. So it looks great, Might, it'd be fun to work in, but it uses about 47% more lighting, uh, has about twice the plug loads, and there is photovoltaics on there that, are, um, for, that produce 40% less power than they were anticipating. Now, uh, with this and all of these buildings, I really want to highlight that these were designed as really the highest performing buildings you can get. They're state of the art at the time that really took advantage of all the tools available but there were still problems. And so a lot of the work, a lot of this presentation is based on a report done in NREL where we, they went in buildings like this and said, what went wrong? We, we did everything we could to make this building perform great. What went wrong? And so that kind of thing is what I'd like to talk about. In this case, notice all the dark colors. That, um, choices like that, as well as the, um, the interior arrangement of the, the furniture, block out a lot of the light and, and really were one of the contributing causes to why they didn't perform as well as it could. Um, so in that case, it's, you know, models are too crude? They weren't counting on the interior designer to change the color scheme, really. And they were, they were counting on highly reflective surfaces and the walls and, and stuff. But they didn't spec it, and the interior designer didn't know it, so they, they went with a darker look. So yeah, so that's the case for that one. Um, it can be a problem. I, um, I'm a huge fan of modeling. I think it really can help us see how buildings are going to be before, we, before we've built them. That being said, an over-reliance on them or a, uh, a belief in their absolute per uh, their, their high perf or perfection can really get us into trouble when, it, when we're trying to design a high-performance building and it doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, perform as well as expected. It really can have Put a cast a bad light on uh, modeling, on green building in general, and it really it, it just wastes energy. And it, it uh, it's it's something that we that needs to be talked about and discussed so we can recognize and avoid those challenges. Um, so this NREL study that I was talking about looked at six buildings. Um, all, all over the country in different state, in different places, and looked at why they weren't performing as well as, as they were anticipated to through the modeling uh, of them. So, those are the more. So, let's see. So, as you can see here, they, uh, they ranked how their predicted versus where their measured were. This scale is how much energy they were expecting to save. So as they're getting the higher uh, or the lower measured performance, that means they're performing significantly worse than anticipated. And um, one of them, the Bighorn Home Improvement, did better, but all the rest did, did quite a bit worse. So what happened? Um, well, I guess. The, the first common mistake is that, uh, that modelers often overlook specific types of end uses, um, like different kinds of uh, plug loads and things like that. They sometimes forget to account for nighttime loads and changing occupancy. And, uh, equip and um, let's see, sorry. Let me jump ahead. Okay, yeah. 
and uh, lack of training by the people who are actually operating in, and running these buildings. So um, here's an example of some occupancy scheduling that went, went awry, and it was in the Cambria office of the US EPA. Basically, they, uh, they predicted that people were going to be there for have a MAC occupancy of about 120 people per week, and it was actually closer to 70 because people were traveling, working from home, doing other things. They assumed a longer work day, and the actual work day was quite a bit shorter. And uh, so, and then on the on the flip side, the Big Point, Bighorn Home Improvement, one thing they weren't anticipating is when the cleaning crews came in, they switched on all the lights of the whole building, and that actually, in many cases, set a demand peak, which which had a, a big effect on their their bills every month because the whole the whole building was turned on at once, and that wasn't anticipated for back when they designed the 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 building. Um, let's see. Actually, I wanted to. All right. Another one is the weather data was is often not accurate. In many cases, when you're doing a, a simulation, you grab whatever data you can get. In some cases, you can go find uh, find something for the specific city you're looking in, but a lot of times there isn't weather data in places that aren't in urban centers or next to airports. And so you, you pr predict, you pick some climate that's close to where the, the uh, performance actually is, and there are, are significant risks that if you don't get it just right, it, um, the, the results come off. For example, at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, they uh, it's located in Annapolis, but they use data from Baltimore. And one thing, uh, one thing they did in this in this building was, uh, let's see, they they because the weather's generally warmer, the energy performance was was pretty far off. And another one at Zion that that I was talking about, they did um, simulations based on uh, on weather records for Cedar City, which isn't that far away. But it's because, they th the, because it's significantly cooler, they cut back from three cooling towers to two cooling towers. And what that meant is you still could get the cooling, but the towers needed to run uh, more or less constantly to try to keep up with, with uh, the cooling load. So it, it was one of those cases where if, if the weather data was more accurate, it would have worked, it would have helped out uh, significantly. But again, that, that's harder, that's, it's hard to do, but worth talking about. Are there any questions or comments? So how do you get weather data for Zion's National Park? I mean, is there a weather station out there somewhere that you just have to search on the web until you find it, or what's your recommendation? Often there is weather stations that you can grab the data for, but they don't have like a data structured so that you could input it into DO2 or an Energy Plus. But the data does exist as far as like maybe specific data points. And so what's worthwhile is to try to find any kind of data set you can and cross compare it with a data set that you, you're thinking about using that is complete and has everything else that, that, uh, that DO2, for example, would want. It, it's definitely an extra step and takes a, a long, it takes longer than you want it to, but it's, it's really the only way I, c I could ever figure out how to do it. So, but there are weather stations all over. So, um, so uh, one thing is just generally going into a model to account for as many plug loads as possible and account for the fact that they're going to, to expand more than likely. So um, in many cases, you can, when designing a building, you can make it appear to be high performance by adjusting what you uh, imagine the occupants plug loads would be when in fact oftentimes people come in and plug in electric um, floor uh, plug in electric heaters or bring in an extra computer or or something else that wasn't anticipated the occupancy schedules are a, are a critical one but it's it's really because occupancy drives the consumption so much it's, it's, it's a vital topic that's not really easy to nail down, especially when you're talking about places where the people have flex time or the, the custodial crew comes in later to, to do cleaning. It's, it's hard to juggle, but if you do have detailed interviews with the, people, the building managers and get good, clear, 
accurate scheduling, then it's, it's possible to make a more accurate simulation. Sure? That example you said where they had fewer occupants in there, fewer hours, why would they, why would the building use more energy? Um, that's a good question, and I don't have a, I honestly don't have a good answer. That was just more of an example of inaccurate mo um, model, uh, inaccurate scheduling than it was having a direct line to their energy consumption. Anything else? Um, another one is a, the, a disjointed construction process. There were cases, even with these, these uh, the six buildings were all high-end buildings, like the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. There was a, th a uh, national thermal test center that, that's going to come up, that things just kind of got installed wrong. For example, um, one, one common occurrence is a significant portion of the population that does do construction work, doesn't have in, speak English as their native tongue. And I know of very few um, contractors who will translate their, their documents into, the, into another language. And so it does lead for confusion and it really can ultimately cost a building. When it, when it comes down to smaller things uh, that have a big impact, it's important that people know how to install different equipment that's spec'd out. Uh, for example, at that uh, thermal test center, they actually, the, their, the plan was to put insulation around the foundation um, to sort of hold in a thermal mass, and that insulation didn't go in, and people didn't realize it until it was already pretty well buried, and so it, it was too late to go back and dig it up again and re-put in the insulation. So in this, this center, which is designed to show off thermal performance, there is a, a pretty significant um, a uh, pretty significant energy loss gap down at the bottom. So, uh, another one is uh, in Boulder, we, David Johnson is an architect who's, who has a lot of experience designing really high-end buildings, but when he was working on his own house, he had a bunch of Spanish-speaking um, uh, contractors, and he couldn't communicate what, what, he, uh, what he wanted to see in the design until his wife got home, who spoke Spanish fluently and, and could really commun translate for them. Uh, this one, or this one is the one that came up right in the, the beginning of the slide, and it's lack of coordination with interior designers. Uh, daylighting is a wonderful thing that save, that saves lots of energy, has has definitely has beneficial impacts when it's done well and done right. The problem is if uh, if the person who designs the lighting system is is different than the person who actually comes up with the interior design and they're not communicating about what, what possibilities they have, it's really hard to make a, um, make a well-performing building. For example, lighting designers typically in a daylighting building try to go for a 90% uh, reflectance on walls and, and furniture and things like that. This didn't have that, so it di significantly diminished the, uh, the lighting capacity of it. The, uh, for example, in the file storage area, they had, a, um, had to end up, because they, they had these movable file cabinets that ended up being bigger as they collected more and more um, files, it started blocking out the light so that ultimately they needed to put in 30 uh, T8 lighting fixtures to make up for what, the, what was supposed to come out of daylighting. Uh, this is the Zion Visitors Center. Or, oop. This is the Zion um, Visitor Center. They had the, the same problem in a lot of cases for this, basically making dark uh, dark interiors. Another related thing is when the when the process is disconnected between the lighting designer and the the um, the people uh, engineering it throughout the process, the uh, a lot of times, daylighting technologies can get um, can get cost engineered out of a project. For example, the Denver International Airport has a really phenomenal uh, daylighting system and was really designed to take advantage of it. The thing is, is, the electric lights stay on all the time because when they were going through the process and blueprinting it and value engineering it to figure out how you know how they could save a little bit of money, they took out all the lighting controls because they, they saw it as kind of a marginal thing, and effectively that means they put in lots of windows that, are, that you don't really use for capturing energy. So 
a lot of times is it, uh, a crucial piece is a maintaining the dialogue throughout the whole design team but also to uh, also it's good to have somebody who kind of gets the whole system through it from the beginning all the way to the end that can spot things like that and say look if you're gonna if we're gonna value engineer out the lighting controls we need to rethink the uh, the daylighting system or windows and and start again in many ways uh, oh, and that's what I was saying uh, one tool uh, that I found pretty cool um, just more in the vein of talking about different modeling technologies is the Department of Energy and the Lawrence Berkeley Labs came up with this great uh, tool to, to really inspire people to think about efficient lighting for commercial buildings. And really what it is is you start by telling it what kind of building you're looking for, what kind of code constraints you're under, and then it starts giving you design vignettes where you can pick out different lighting scenarios. So for example, so you go through here, they've got, um, so for each of these design scenarios, this I, I picked the, uh, the specialty grocery. And in each section, when you click on, on the bakery side of that, they say, here's a bunch of lighting that actually works pretty well. It gives the, uh, the lighting per, per square foot that, that the building could use. And you can go through and pick and say, all right, I, 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 maybe that lighting would work. Maybe if, if we did these um, track sconces and decorative lighting, that would do it. So you click that and you get this, um, this sort of detailed resource where it talks specifically about what, what do these lighting look like, how much energy do they use, and it's really a, a pre-packaged um, selection of really great, uh, of, of really high performing technologies. Um, and basically, and let's see. As you go through that, you, choose, you can also choose control strategies, and this is what it outputs. It outputs a energy report, which will basically say, we're estimating based on the square footage you gave them and the, and the design choices you made just by choosing which suite of, of lighting you would like. This gives a, uh, a energy summary. It gives the a description, a detailed description of what all those lighting um, pieces are and how they work as well as, uh, as mock-up blueprints, as well as descriptions of like how far apart should this lighting be separated, and, uh, and links to manufacturers. Finally, and I think this was really brilliant, is they, they do the, uh, the luminaire schedule. Because a lot of times, uh, working in an office, if you're, you're, you pick one project that, works, that seemed to work well, and when you need to do lighting for the next project, you copy and paste the luminaire schedule just to save a lot of trouble in typing and figuring it out. In this case, they're saying, hey, let's just jump in the middle and why don't you just use this luminaire schedule and sort of cut to the chase for, for example, an architecture firm. So I think this is a neat tool. And one thing I think is really valuable about it is I think it, um, it's pretty intuitive, simple to use. It has lots of information, but it's written clearly. And it's something that could be shared with people across the uh, throughout the, uh, the building process so that people can understand why you're coming from where when you're cho choosing different lighting technologies. All right, here's another one. Um, basically in uh, the, in, in uh, this building it's, um, they basically had a clearly identified, this is how much power we're gonna get out of the photovoltaics. But as you'll notice, right as you, they should have been harvesting the most power they could possibly get, they were getting nothing or almost nothing. And really what happened is, um, is the poor performance was because it wasn't designed and installed accurately. They specced a different inverter than actually went in. And so what was happening is, is as the voltage was getting good and it was producing a lot, it knocked out the, uh, the um, inverter and uh, and nobody noticed because nobody was going through the bills saying you know we're not really making as much from those photovoltaics as we were planning on doing um, and so the annual production they were annual production was about 60 percent of what the simulated problem was and and really it would have been caught a lot earlier if somebody had been paying had somebody had been watching the energy bills and seeing how much was coming back and and try to capture some of that. Here's another, another example. Oh, 
at uh, Oberlin College. They have a, a really, oh, sure. So in the Cambria project that was corrected with a different word. Yeah, and it was solved, so. Yeah, it was just, it was poorly spec technology and they just didn't chase it through. So, um, here's another one at Oberlin College. They put in this, uh, really a phenomenal building in a, in a lot of ways and a really a great performing building, but there were certain issues with it that didn't quite, didn't quite gel. And one of them was uh, it had a largely flat roof where a lot of the photovoltaics were. And so as it snowed, their production went down and down and down. Um, so overall, it reduced the, it reduced the system performance uh, significantly and, they were, and it could have been potentially solved if somebody had, if, they, uh, if the peaks were higher or if it was made so that people could brush off the snow. So generally, the, the evaluations when it comes to these kinds of problems is really just to monitor, 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 especially in the first few years a building is performing. Keep an eye and see how, if, if there's a PV system, is it, is it delivering what you're expecting it to deliver? And if not, solve the problem there. Other, otherwise, it may take a long time to notice that there's a problem. So. All right. Um, not all, uh, as I'm a huge fan of daylighting and think there's a lot of potential in it, but not all daylight is, is, is very effective. Uh, I worked, I did an energy audit of a school once where they, they, they had heard that daylighting was good for, uh, good for education, and it is. There's some pretty phenomenal uh, results shown through different studies. For example, the Hersheng Mahang group uh, did a study of 21,000 American students in different, in different grades all across the country and found that students that were in a, in a classroom that had a lot of daylight out were, had a faster learning rate of about 26%. And that's, that's huge. That's the difference between a barely performing C student and an A student across huge swaths of, of the population. So daylighting is great. We know it works. The, the, the problem is it's not, at, there are times where it doesn't work as well as it could. A big one, you catch all the, let's see, let me jump into it. One big thing is, uh, is gl these glare problems. At, at the school I worked at, <laughs> sorry, I got distracted there. The school I was at, basically they had come in and put glazing over the entire uh, envelope of the building pretty much. It was either glazing or aluminum siding. And what that did is a, it had horrible thermal performance, so they were basically in the winter running the heater all the time and not getting the savings. But it also meant that there was bright spots in rooms that just sort of um, kind of blinded a student in one corner and the other corner, uh, uh, a student in the other side, it was dark. So, um, so let's see. So yeah, there are some typical daylighting challenges. One thing I wanted to say about each of these was over dimming is when, when the, the system responds too much and it thinks there's more sun than there is. And so what that happens is very quickly people figure out how to override that system, maybe put a little piece of black tape over the sensor and all of a sudden a daylighting system isn't really anymore. Um, under dimming is actually a lot more insidious. It's if the, uh, if the sensors aren't recognizing what it, what's there, the electric lights stay on, so people think they have a daylighting system, but the electric lights are going all the time, so there's really not much savings going that way. And then controls are, are a big issue for uh, a few reasons. So I'm going to be talking about that in a bit. Glare, the glare problems. Um, Basically, the human eye has a human, huge capacity to adapt to different light levels, ranging from a moonlit night in the woods to a, a sunny day on the beach. The human eye can adapt somewhere in that spectrum. Where what happens when you have a, a high glare is even if the room generally is lit perfectly acceptably to work in, if there's a band of really bright light, one's eyes adjust, and, it's, uh, and then it becomes hard to see any, anything anywhere. Anybody have any questions or comments? So here's one way to do it. Just block off that monitor. <laughs> Extra points for trying to get rid of that monitor because flat screens are way more efficient anyway. Um, 
Some general uh, concepts when trying to do daylighting is that top lit systems pretty much almost always work. They, um, I think, let's see. We've got a study that said, in a recent study of 36 top-lit installations in California, they found that those systems were really generally delivering about 98% of the savings that they were expected to. They work like people anticipate, and, and the savings are, are pretty bankable. So, and whereas when you have side lighting systems, A, it's hard to avoid those glare issues that come across, not impossible, but harder. And then B, it, uh, and, and B, furniture can move in and around it. Like at that school I was at, they ended up putting uh, bookshelves next to all of those, that glass around the outside. So they just got, got lost, all, they, the light didn't ever work for them. It overheated the building because they were getting too much summer heat, but it was too cold in the winter and they didn't get the light because people moved it around. If they were more on the top light side, it, it would have worked a lot better. Um, there's uh, uh, based on the NREL study, they came through and said, in a lot of cases, unless there's really a lot of time to invest in making sure the system is right and tuned right, it's really worthwhile to keep it simple. Um, let's see, the, uh, a group at AEC that commissions daylighting systems really found that if they had one sensor to control six or eight classrooms on the side of a building, they could calibrate that sensor just right and actually and, and have a good performing system across those, those rooms. Whereas in the case of, a, uh, of putting a sensor in every single room, it meant that periodically somebody would need to go through and calibrate each one and that generally meant they, all, they got off quicker. So in that case, even though you can get a little more efficiency by doing more measurement, in this case it didn't quite work. So that's why they encourage to keep it simple, even though there are other opportunities. Um, so also the uh, one thing I think is interesting is this simplified um, daylight harvesting system based out of the, the California Lighting Center. They're doing a lot of great work there with different energy efficiency technologies. And basically it uses uh, photo sensors and relays to really um, to customize the light levels based on, on the light, or customize the electric light based on the light in the, in the space. Now, not any one piece of those technologies um, is revolutionary. We had photo sensors and everything else for a long time. But when they had it integrated in a package, they were able to get a system that, that can consistently work, that you install once, and it self-adjusts and figures out the point it needs to be and stays there. So it's a, it's a really great system and worth checking out. Uh, well, like, let's see. Closed loop performance is when the photosensors sensors monitor both the daylight and the electric light, and the signals uh, are used to adjust the electric lights. The, let's see, let me make sure I'm getting there right here. The open loop systems monitor the incoming daylight, but not the electric lights and are adjusted in response to the daylight system. And so, um, in that case, that, was, that is more of a, the, the system in California the, at the Davis was more of an open system because it, it measures what the outdoor light is and doesn't measure what the indoor uh, electric light was and sort of adapted it to fit that. So that's an example. I don't have a, a specific example of one of these buildings. Yeah, um, I personally haven't designed one, but that but this came out of that study from NREL, and they said that they were significantly easier to calibrate. So, so that's what I'm going on. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Uh, the other thing is is just good judicious glazing, making sure that. Uh, that light can penetrate deeply into a room without giving glare in any one point. So it's basic passive solar uh, design techniques come in really handy. If you look at this, this is the thermal test center. They, uh, there isn't actually that much glazing, even though it's a really, really well lit, day lit building, there isn't that much. So it's not like often when people think green buildings, they think let's just 
coat the whole uh, coat the whole side in, in glazing, and it's that's not doesn't often work well. Along those lines, I'm a, I'm a big fan of. Has anybody used SketchUp before? So I thought this plugin was cool. It's just a quick and easy way to see where the, the uh, sun can go. It's a free download and a free install. One thing I thought was pretty cool is you can set analysis points at different points in your building and then get a, a uh, and then run, a sim run it through a year and see how much light actually hits different points in a building. Here's a, another uh, an example, and basically what, what this one is, is going into a, um, uh, let's see here, let me make sure I have the building. All right, in this building, um, the problem here was that the photovoltaics are made into that awning system, which, is, which looks really cool, both from inside and out, and kind of really Keeps it keeps photovoltaics front and center in the in the in the building. The problem is is uh, photovoltaics don't are lose significant amount of capacity when they're shaded. The way it works is it has, has a voltage that develops across two sides of the crystalline uh, photovoltaic cell, and so it develops a voltage between the two. And so if you have a huge solar panel, the the it'll build up the amount of power you can get out across it. But if you have a tree or something or something like this blocking it and putting a line of shade across a, a PV panel. It's like a dead voltage zone that makes it very difficult for the for the power to pass through. So what effectively that does is whenever there's any shade from any of those beams going across that, it knocks the per, the production of that PV down to almost nil. So this is an example of one where they they wanted to ex uh, show how green it was by putting it front and center, but it ended up working against them and, and had to conflict. This one, um, it was at the, uh, the Bighorn Home Improvement Center, and they decided they too really wanted to, uh, to promote how, the, how sustainable the building was, so they ended up putting uh, photovoltaics on the roof and ended up skimping on the insulation below, the, below these photovoltaics. And really, what that means is they're going to end up spending way more in heating and cooling because they have an uninsulated roof than they would have, uh, than they would have ever produced through those photovoltaics. So you can see the photovoltaics below? I'm not sure. I, so I haven't been in there. Why did they not insulate them? I, I think it was uh, just cost cutting later in the process. And it, it was insulated to uh, a lower spec than they could have. But this is one of those cases where if it really wouldn't have been that much more expensive to beef up the insulation, save way more energy than it was. Uh, and uh, at the North Boulder Recreation Center, in, uh, in, uh, where I'm coming from, they, uh, they put in um, electric vehicle recharging centers um, all throughout just because they wanted to, to really promote the, the potential of it. The problem is, is because there was so much money spent on that, there was a lot less money to spend on things like buying an efficient HVAC system. So there's still not electric cars plugged into there, but they're paying a fortune in, in energy bills that they really didn't need to do. So, um, so part of it is going through a building and designing a building. I'm a, I'm a big fan of LEED and think it makes really high performing buildings and, and can get us there. The problem is, is when designers go through and just go point shopping and say, what can I get, what can I get for how many points and really not invest in, in choosing the right or appropriate technology. It's choosing photovoltaics instead of insulation because you can get points for it. Um, So at the, the biggest key, I think, to making a building perform uh, exactly as a modeler would anticipate, I actually solved it. What you do is you take out all exterior doors. So once the building is going, you can just sort of leave it be and nobody will ever go in and disturb it. Unfortunately, uh, people aren't going to design buildings so that people can't go in. And so there's a constant um, 
a constant interaction between the users of the building and the original designers of the building. Much can change throughout the design process. A lot of times the, the use of it changes. A-Source is now in a building that used to be a lab, and now it's an office building, and it was designed for that, and, and now it has a totally different, um, different application, and it's hard to keep up with changes like that. Another thing is, um, let me see if I have some. Uh, in, another, uh, in another case at, the, um, at, Z at Zion, they had a huge tram wall that was collecting heat throughout the day because it's a big stone structure in, the, in front of glass facing windows and re-radiate that heat into the whole building. Well, shortly after they moved in, they decided to rearrange how the offices were, and they ended up putting a lot of offices next to the tram wall, which meant those, those offices were overheated and people were complaining about that temperature, and the heat didn't get delivered into the rest of the building, so they ended up, um, so they ended up it ended up costing a lot more energy to get the building to work, work right, and nobody was comfortable throughout. Um, so, let's see. Hmm. All right, um, let's see, I'm, I'm missing a couple slides here. All right, I'll just jump ahead. Sometimes what you can do is, is just tell people what to do with good signage and, uh, and, and really having an educational discussion with the ultimate building occupants. Another thing, I, I'm missing some slides, I thought there were, but one big thing that happens a lot in commercial buildings is uh, as organizations get bigger, they end up investing more in their IT infrastructure. So if you're a law office, all of a sudden you'll get a computer, a server to do, hold your email, then another for, um, for web server, another for a file server. All of a sudden you have a lot of very energy intensive equipment, generally in a small place. Oftentimes you don't want to give that a nice big window, so you put it in a closet or in a back room that has no windows somewhere. And what that does is it really, it totally throws an HVAC system out of whack because they have to deal with this superheated room as well as, as, uh, as the rest of the building with, with quite a bit less. So um, one thing to ask if you're doing a pre-design interview with, with users, with uh, a new building designer is to ask, what are their IT plans coming in the future? Is there a plan for consolidation into, um, into servers or how that, how's that going to be, even if it's not in the works right away? Um, so this slide is basically just about um, signage. If, the more you can explain the, the purpose of a, of a technology or insight or how to use something or keep windows open or closed, uh, at, at the space, you're ensuring that future generations of, of building occupants that are using that can understand what, what the point is of different systems and use them appropriately. Um, so, uh, let's see. The overall conclusions are that there are challenges, but there are a lot of solutions to them. It just involves keeping an open dialogue and maintaining it with, with, the, with uh, everybody at every stage of the construction process. And um, let's see, there is hope. At the Oberlin College, this is, their, um, this is how, their, how the building performed. Basically, the Optimize was the original version that they thought they were aiming for. And their first year, or first few years actually, weren't, were performing closer to that base case. Once they came in and started uh, commissioning the building and really going through and catching a lot of the, these little problems, they've been consistently able to improve over the years. So there is hope and, and buildings do get better. Uh, just along, just because we're um, closing up, so this is one of my, my final slides. And uh, I just wanted to point out another cool modeling thing I found was, um, has anybody used the energy design plugin for SketchUp? Yeah. Do you, did you find it useful or? Very, it's a lot better than imagining points in space. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, yeah, I just, I heard about this a little while ago and man, I'm jealous because um, I worked doing Do2 modeling using eQuest and we'd spend weeks on coming up with a modeling every 3D surface or not, not every single surface, but enough of them to really model the building and just the, the data entry and trying to hold it in, in one's head while, while putting it in, into that made it 
a really slow time and a slow process. And what that also does is because it's so slow to enter the geometry, it's a lot harder to just play with an idea and think, well, what if this building was a little bit bigger and wider and shaped a little differently? When it's going to take another week to enter those data points in to get those shapes down just right, it kind of makes you think, you know, actually I think this building is okay as it is. What SketchUp has for those, of, uh, for those that haven't used it, it's a really fast and easy way basically to do 3D geometry. So like you draw a square and then you, you click on the square, you pull it up and you have a box, draw a square on the box, click hit delete, and now you have a window in the box, orient it however you want, and it can happen really fast and really dynamic. So this project I'm really excited about because they came up with the geometry interface to pull in all those, all those data points and pre-populate an Energy Plus file so it can do a simulation right as you're working on it. And so the idea is you can change a building on the fly and see its effects. I'm looking forward, they're talking about adding different additions to this to really build it out and put in, um, allow you to maybe put in building systems and things like that, which would, would really change how modeling works. But just the geometry, I think, is, uh, is really huge and, and will have a significant impact. Um, so, that's my presentation. Are there any questions or comments? Or? I heard you mentioned commissioning once. Mm -hmm. I thought maybe you might mention it more. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. It seems to me that that is such a huge barrier in all your research and how, how much has that, had that come up? A lot. I, even you're right. I, I shouldn't have been remiss in doing it. because. Oh, yeah, sure. The question was, he was wondering, I only mentioned commissioning once when it seems like that's something that should really, really be a part of all of this. And, uh, and my answer is that that's a great point. And honestly, I, I didn't mention it because I kind of see it all as commissioning. Basically, commissioning is when you take a systematic analysis of how a building can work and tune up how the performance is. And so that's a lot of, of what they did with these buildings. Initially, they were designed to perform really well. They missed the mark for for various reasons, and so then the commissioning team comes in and really figures out what went wrong and how to optimize it. But it's a great point because there's, um, the uh, Lawrence Berkeley Labs actually have a study going on now where they're aggregating as many examples of building commissioning on retro commissioning as they can get and try to get how, how it performs and how well. Basically, they've found that uh, they can, and a median savings across, I think they've got 8,000 different projects in their database, was about 15% of the energy use um, based on, on a commission, uh, building commissioner going in, tweaking different things, often not with huge infrastructure investments, just tuning the HVAC systems to work well. So the paybacks were, about, I think it was like, an, a median payback was 0.7 years because it's saving 15% on commercial energy space. So that's, that's a really great point. And I, I should have said really commissioning is where it's at and that's really where, how these buildings got, how these problems got found and how they ultimately can get fixed. I know a number of these buildings were LEED certified. In order to be LEED certified, you have to do commissioning. So uh, was the commission just, uh, what, what, what do you suppose to happen? Um, I'm not sure exactly what, um, a lot of these, when the, none of the buildings were, were poor performers, they were already strong performing, so it might have, I, I'm not sure where the earlier commissioners came in, but there could have been a point where they said, yeah, this building is way outperforming its, its neighbor building with that equivalent size, so it, it's doing okay versus having they had uh, people from NREL come in and really do a detailed analysis that, that changed it. So. I'm not sure what the answer is if there was a different group doing it as well, but I could definitely see room for both to be in there. Two questions. One, uh, after you use the mic here, or test on it. You're gonna have two questions, you have to use the mic. Number one, um, Ashley 90.1 specifically said that energy simulation is not a prediction of energy consumption of the building later on. So uh, what's your comment on it? And the second question is, do you have any experience on, or do you know anybody who has used energy simulation beyond the design stage? 
for example, in during the operation, during the commissioning, during the renovation? Oh, yeah, great questions. Um, well, with the first comment, with the the, the ash rate, it's it's true that I'm. My comment to to his point that that it's not assumed as a predictor of energy performance. Is, it's absolutely true. It's kind of the, what I was trying to get at through this presentation is that energy simulation is a great tool, but for, for me, I feel like it's a really great tool to do relative, relative assessments. So for example, you come up with an energy simulation of a building that, that's just about right. With that kind of building, then you could maybe change the window um, emissivity or something and see what that performance would be. And you get a good relative sense of, is that a big deal? Did it really change a lot? Am I changing in the right direction or not? But you're right, it won't tell us this is how much energy that building will, will use ultimately, because there's too much in the air about that. Um, the further question about, uh, about doing energy simulations after, um, after buildings have been up, there, has, there is some effort to do that, and, it's based, and there's a couple different scenarios. One is where people keep, keep their models tuned up by calibrating them to the actual energy level. So, there are models for all of those buildings, and when they, they can um, go back and, and sort of put in real world data and, and change it, the system. I don't think that's done as often as it should be, but it, it, it is a possibility. Another one is, uh, I've got some, some uh, friends who work doing, um, one friend who does building commissioning who's been known to put together a simple DO2 model on, on just general ideas, but usually commissioning doesn't do that. Usually they use Excel and, and different ways to just really drill down onto the system. Um, I also, um, I've heard of performance contractors that do it, but oftentimes, um, I, I, and I think it's a great idea, and I think performance contractors should do it. But they, I've got a couple friends who do it and say, well, if the client asks for it, then we do it. Otherwise, we'll do a simpler, quicker system. So it, it much depends on who's asking for it. I don't know of, a, I personally don't know of a movement where people are really just doing it to, to really see, to get performance through. Thanks. You mentioned that a lot of problems could have been avoided in construction if somebody had enforced the specification and put in what it uh, was originally designed for. Um, and you mentioned that somebody needs to keep tabs on all that. Is that, in your opinion, the architect or is it an outside consultant that you bring on board that uh, is trying to help you monitor all these things and enforce the specification? Or, I mean, what's your response on who's responsible for helping to kind of mastermind this whole yeah. thing. Honestly, I think it's a good, um, it's a project manager role, typically. A lot of times they're, they're the person sort of who signs at the end of the day to make sure things go off, go together okay. And that is where the sort of the, where a lot of it officially goes through now. The problem is, is a lot of project managers may not fully grasp the, the, the whole process and, and the benefits and losses of pulling out daylighting controls or something like that. And so I guess, um, I'm, I, for me, it's more of a question. I think I would be, it would be great if the person who designed the building, an architect who really understands what, what their vision is, for them to check in on the job site and see that things are working out. That's not, in a perfect world, that's not how it would be. You should be able to just make your drawing and then move on to the next project and forget all about it. In, in the world where buildings don't sometimes get built the way they should, I think it'd be worthwhile to work it into the timeline of a project, to be able to just periodically visit or, or call and check in when, when you know something complex or different than typical construction is going in, to call and say, so you guys got that this is different than you're usually doing. But you're right, it's a, it's a good question, and it's, I don't know if there's a clear answer to it other than have somebody who knows everything and knows all and keeps tabs on everything everywhere all the time. Any more? Other questions for Micah? Well, cool. thank, thank you very you. much. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs>
sorry about it. Uh, those online, it went down. Hopefully some of you got back on again. And uh, tune in again next week. Guy Nushin will be here all the way from Canada to talk about dimming ballasts. And I think that's going to be a uh, very interesting presentation. And um, there are flyers in the back for the uh, building simulation work group. Please help yourself to those. That's going to be an interesting work group. And if you haven't signed in, please do so before you leave. We really need that information so um, we can keep holding these events. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you online for, for attending and your patience. And on behalf of Better Bricks and the Integrated Design Labs, glad you were here.